testing. Uh, Kent Oster from Exact Scientific Local Lab is going to talk a little bit about how to take the water sample. So, thanks. Everyone. All right. Do you hear me? Uh, just to give you a little background of who and what I do, I own a laboratory. Uh, we are an ISO accredited 17025 laboratory. We're located in Ferndale. We do water testing and product testing, environmental testing. Um, to give you a little background about me, I grew up in Linden on a dairy farm about seven miles due west on the Birch Bay Linden Road. Uh, growing up, I worked in a berry plant. <laughs> I actually, uh, for a summer job, I changed irrigation for EB Farms. So. Just to give you my knowledge, we did a lot of irrigation, a lot of what you're dealing with now, I, I know your concepts and how to work with them. So why is it important? Uh, five years ago, nobody really cared. Throw water, as long as we had water and we had a right, we were okay. Even rights are getting to be more and more. So really the big thing is, is FSMA regulations. And what they come down to is water can be a carrier for microbial contamination. And what it does is we're trying to reduce the introduction of pathogens. So water is a, is a good source of pathogens. E. coli, they picked the generic E. coli, not because it's a pathogen, but it's easy to test for. Pathogens we worry about, E. coli 0157, salmonella, listeria, those type things, viruses. Very expensive to monitor, while a generic E. coli is, is a lot easier. Water sources, so we're gonna go over some sources. So you get wells. You got your ponds, uh, a lot of dug ponds. You got your streams, your river, and we get into holding tanks or tank reservoirs. Uh, so I know you have an holding tanks that are open tops. You have holding tanks that are below ground that have covers. So we'll get in a little bit about that. So wells, what's, what's great about wells, they're easy to clean and maintain as far as if a well gets dirty, we shock it. So we just add some chlorine bleach to it, clean it up. A well is like a glass. We gotta clean the glass out because the source water coming in, we're assuming is clean. You get into shallow wells and you get into the talk of what the state looks like, was talking about as far as shallow wells under the influence. I've done a lot of the, what's called the MPA tests back in the day, where if a shallow well is within 200 feet of a uh, body of surface water, they had to monitor it to see if it was influenced by that surface water because there could be a direct contact. So temperature, where you're looking for algae, all kinds of different things. So that's, that's where you get the question about the well, is it considered surface water? Because there are wells that are directly connected to bodies of surface water. Big thing about a well is, and being on a dairy farm, a piece of plywood on top of a well doesn't work. It's not gonna protect it. It's not gonna keep it clean. So. Put a, put a concrete, I know everybody's got concrete wells, get it sealed. Seal it up, get it so that it's protected. If it's not protected, you're gonna get mice that go in it, you're gonna get rats that go in it. Everything that goes into it that way, now we're gonna have issues with E. coli. The issue with this county, with wells, high levels of iron. And everybody's probably dealt with iron and drip irrigation and how it's a pain. So. People dealing with wells are going to have to uh, deal with the iron. The only other trouble with wells, low volume of water. So sometimes you pump them dry, not all wells can maintain. We're no longer small farmers, we're big farms, need a lot of water. So it's another drawback that can happen with a well. We get into ponds, large volume of water. People love ponds, trouble is it becomes stagnant. And when they become stagnant and they just sit there, Bacteria growth. Everybody's dealing with leaves and things falling in there, ducks on ponds, stuff like that. That carries E. coli. So ponds, you're gonna have issues with that. They can, a lot of ponds can have low levels of iron still. You'll still see it build up, but usually it's less. You're not worried about it as wells. North County wells, high iron levels, issues. Streams and rivers. Large volume of water again. It's a continuous flow of water, but with, stream, and that with streams and rivers, the E. coli counts can vary. So when we get into ponds and streams and what are surface water, I expect E. coli. They're not clean. We know they're not clean. So you can expect it. That's why you have the surface water with applications of 126. Never expect a stream or a river to be a clean source of E. coli-free body of water. Now we get into holding tanks. 
So you get above ground, below ground. Again, usually they put in the holding tanks because a well or a pond or something can't maintain, so you need a larger source of water to keep up. So they put in a holding tank to, to collect the water. Things about holding tanks, they can be clean, they can be treated, and it's easier to manage those. Um, so then you gotta look at your source. So are you using a well? Are you using surface water for your source? Because if you're using, I know an open base holding tank up in uh, North of Linden, it uses a pond to fill the tank. And it's like, well, why use a tank if you've got a large pond? Well, they're using the pond to fill the tank because they can treat the tank and take care of that. Because there's no way they're going to be able to treat and maintain the pond with an E. coli free. A holding tank, they at least now have a body of water that they're using that they can control and, and work with as far as a treatment process. Sampling containers. Now we get into sampling for water tests. You've got a sterile bottle. E. coli testing is the clear bottle. You'll see a little white powder in there. With that used, they make sodium thiosulfate. So if you want to cheat and take a sample and put a little chlorine in there, sodium thiosulfate is going to neutralize that chlorine. So uh, it's used so we catch you. So the other thing with that is my test that I use to test for E. coli, if it's high in, in uh, chlorine, it turns purple. So you fail right off the bat. So if you think you're going to cheat by adding chlorine, there's two ways we're going to catch you on it. The bottle on the right is a non-sterile bottle, but it is used for, treating, for taking samples for metals such as iron. You talk about your heavy metals, different things like that. That's the type of bottle you're going to use. The other thing you see on the sterile bottle is you see a little line. It's a 100 mil line. So the regulations call for this test to be per 100 mils. That means I have to examine 800 mils of water. I don't get 10 mils, I don't get 50 mils, 100 mils. So you need to fill your bottle above that line to make it a legal sample. Water sampling now. From wells, we usually hope that we see a faucet or something of that nature. You can take it from your irrigation line, your drip lines. We get into there's two things here. We get into FSMA and FDA regulations. You also are probably following SQF, BRC regulations. You have client regulations, sampling spots, even though you say, well, FDA says this. If you've got a client telling you something different, your choice to sell it and meet their requirements. So as much as FSMA may say gray, your clients that you're selling to may be black and white saying, this is where you're going to sample. So depending on where they want you to sample, that's where you're going to decide where you're going to pull. Pond, streams, rivers. You're either going to take from your line or you're going to do a dip sample. Um, so with a dip sample, we're trying to get out in the middle of the pond or the middle of the stream to pull that sample. Holding tanks, again, faucet, irrigation line, or a dip sample, depending. And the reason I would try to look at sampling from your source is you want to know what your source is, because if, if you have an issue in the field, is it the line or is it your source? So you're going to have to differentiate. So where you sample is going to help you work on some of your problems. Big thing is sterile technique. So that means try to be as clean as possible. You don't want to take this bottle, the sterile bottle, take the lid off, throw the lid on the ground, sample. It, all that handling, all that you're touching inside there is going to make a difference. Hands and environment contain E. coli. Wash your hands. Sterilize. You know, you take and you put your boots on, you put your hand on the truck, where's your truck been, where are you driven to? All those things are going to play a factor. If you're taking from a faucet, inspect the faucet. If it's dirty, clean it. A lot of those faucets probably don't get turned on until you come out the sample. Well, if it's an outdoor faucet sitting outside, I guarantee you a coyote probably went up and licked that faucet at some point during the summer uh, because it's looking for water. So it's, it's going to go wherever it can. Big thing is, is take a bottle of 10% uh, bleach solution in a spray bottle, use it. Spray on the faucet, spray up in the faucet, spray around it. Get that faucet clean, and then turn the faucet on and let it run. Good two to three minutes, because that little mechanism that's in there that's stopping the water from co coming in can have particles in it. So once you turn it on, it may be sitting there 
flapping in that little flow of water and breaks off when you sample. So give it time to run. Big thing is, don't use frost-free hydrants or faucets. Those mechanisms themselves can cause positives. So the fact that if you go out and take a frost-free hydrant, we had a public water system failing every month for about three or four months. And finally he said, where are you taking your sample from? He goes, well, we got those faucets, you know, the ones with the red handles. Well, it was a public water system. They became written up by the state for all their failures. So, and it was just because he sampled at a frost-free hydrant. So, same as dipping. Sterile technique. Make sure you're clean, your hands, how you're handling your bodies, bottles, streams and ponds. Big thing is watch where you stand. If you walk out into a stream and you're going to sample at the end, you stick your boot in there and all this dirt comes up and you pull a sample, guess what? Your count's just elevated. So if you're trying to meet 126 and because you step, you're at 500, well, you got to be careful about where you're doing. Best thing to try to do is get a, a, get a device or a pole with a, with a bottle attached to it. Try to get out, in the, out away from the edge, a stream that might be easier to pull from at the middle of it, the river, you're not going to get to the middle of a river, but at least if you get four to six feet out from the bank, you're going to get a better uh, sampling. Uh, if you're going to use something to pull the, the water and transfer to a sterile bottle, you've got to make sure you disinfect the container. Use a chlorine solution, anything that you can to make sure that that bottle you're using or that container you're using, I've seen people with stainless steel dips go out and dip, well, that stainless steel dips sitting in the back of your truck, behind your seat, somewhere like that, well, probably has E. coli in it. So you need to clean it before you sample. Here's an e example. Um, you could build your own. Four to six feet of PVC pipe with a zip tie can easily be used and converted to just extend out and pull a bottle. So these are different examples of what you can do. I've used uh, the one on the left where I built a PVC pipe, a couple of elbows, put a zip tie on it, took the cap off my sterile bottle and went out and dipped out into a stream and pulled that. Easy to do. Is there any elevation within the stream that's preferred? Depends on the stream. I would try to get, what's really hard is if you're going to build it so that it, ideally you'd like to go down a little below the surface a little bit because you're usually pulling most foot valves in a stream aren't going to be at the top of the surface. You're going down. If you're going to build it, you want to go in with your bottle backwards, but if your pole isn't strong enough, that bottle's going to go shooting out. So ideally, you got to build it so that you don't lose the bottle, and then you can turn it and take it down a little ways. So just knowing different creeks and things, if you can get down, their foot valve's pretty, you know, a foot or two that would be the best place to take it. Try not taking it on the surface. Um, big thing is, is use, get somebody that's used to taking samples. Get, get the experience handling it. Be consistent with your sampling procedure. Location, time of day, those type of things on streams. Um, big thing is make a note of conditions. So I've had, we, on the phone a lot of times going, oh, my sample's high this time, or my sample's low this time. Okay, well, when did you sample? Well, it was a pouring down rain, there was mud, I noticed that the creek was dirty. Well, if you're making note of these things, it helps explain what's happening to your sample so we can answer some of these questions that you have when it goes high or if it's, you have an outlier that's low or high. Um, environmental conditions with surface waters do make a difference. Next thing, holding time for a sample. We're going with the state. I don't think the FDA's really even mentioned methods or anything, but the state holding time is 30 hours. We'd rather see it sampled and in sooner. Um, but I'm knowing farmers, and I know locations and where you're at. So to try to meet like a six to eight hour window, sometimes it's just not gonna happen. So drinking water's 30 hours. We'd like to see it before then. If you're not gonna get it to the lab right away, make sure you get it, keep it cool. Because if you take a sample and you let it sit in the truck on your heater while you're driving around, you're elevating the counts. They are growing. There is food source in that water sample. So if you took the sample and it was 40, and you bring it to me 18 hours later after it's been sitting in the truck, it may be 400 now. 
So that sampling and that time to get it to me is critical. Again, we need a requirement of a minimum of 100 mils of sample to meet what the, the FDA is saying. It's, the result is per 100 mils. So again, minimum of 100 mils. They extrapolate on what? Uh, as far as like the count? Yeah. Well, if back. If you only got 50? Yeah, if I don't, uh, as far as the sample size, if I get 50, I can't test it. I have to tell you I need more water. Yeah, so we will reject samples. So if I reject it, you don't pay for it. If you cheat and add chlorine and I have to add my reagents to do everything, guess what, I'm charging you for it because it costs me money to do. Um, there's two types of requests for generic E. coli. So you get into this, there's presence, absence, and enumeration. Um, so you get into a presence, absence, that's that zero law. So it's, it's, when I do that test, I have my bottle, I have my reagents to that bottle, it's a yes, no question. If I need to enumerate, I add my reagents to that bottle and I split that bottle up into, I think it's 200 different little wells now. So it's a big difference on how we do. So if you don't mark the right box and you send me in a bottle and you say drinking water sample, I'm doing a presence absence test. It's a yes, no answer. And then you come back and you go, I want to count, too late. I can't give you a count once I run the test. I have to know before I run the test. So paperwork information is very important to get the correct test and information. So if you don't want to fill out paperwork and you just write your name on it and you send it in and you're gonna leave it up to me and I don't know anything, I'm either not gonna test it and you'll call back like six days later saying, where's my sample? And I'll say, what sample? Or, <laughs> um, you get it in there and I might run the wrong test for you. So again, drinking water is presence absence. Irrigation water, E. coli enumeration. Um, one of the things I threw on here is surface water and I think uh, there'll probably be a talk later on. Um, everybody knows about dairy farmers and the issues with the fecal coliform rules on streams and that. Well, one of the things you gotta remember, you're doing a soil amendment and you put a big pile of soil amendment next to a stream and it leaks into that stream, they're going to come after you about the surface water and fecal counts. So be aware that this test down here for surface water for fecal coliform does, is going to start applying to you. And I've heard more and more talks about I throw stuff in my field, the fields are leaching into the streams, farmers are hit, dairy farmers are hit now very farmers, you're on, you're on their radar. So just to warn you. So that is a test. You probably may have to run more and more because you're going to want to monitor your streams that are bordering your properties. So what my thing is, is since you're using irrigation wells and your ponds and things like that, they're not running all year. A lot of times they sit stagnant. So you really should look at this as the same as when you're starting your production, your plants, your different things. You need to have a startup. So if the well sits there, it's going to build up with bacteria. It's going to build up with iron. So you need to flush that, that well out good before you start using it. You may even want to do, look at it and just do a preseason shock with chlorine, which is going to help kill the, the bacteria. And with a well, again, a well is a bottle. It's basically we're looking at it as a cup. And then we need to clean that cup before we start filling it up with water. So that's something you need to look at. Ponds that are stagnant, go look at them. You got a large volume of leaves that are floating on the pond, that's gonna spike your uh, bacteria counts. So clean up around your ponds, streams or rivers. It's really hard to do anything about it, but somewhere, knowing where your foot valves and everything goes in, and usually everybody uses the same spot, it's usually a little deeper along the bank, look to see what happened during the winter. With flooding and different things like that, you got a big log, did the bank erode, is there, it's a pool, it a, sits there and there's not much movement because you're, you're trying to catch that water, so it's usually in a little pond area. So those little ponds, 
could have a higher counts just because of the nature of where it's sitting. So again, you look at that spot where you're pulling that sample from, your irrigation from. Shut down, end of the year. Make sure that your uh, wells are sealed. Check to see any crack, any hole in that well, mice and other things will get in there. Mice carry E. coli. So during the dry season, if you're worried about water, think of all those animals that are out there that are looking for sources of water. An open well is a so source of water. I've opened up wells, took the plywood lid off, looked down inside, saw probably about five to six rats floating in that well. Well, <laughs> that's what you're throwing on your berries. So seal up the well good. Inspect your ponds. Um, where's your source coming from? What are the, are the inlet and outlet streams clear? Are the banks intact? Is everything looking good at that pond? Usually, a lot of these ponds are man-made, so you got to maintain them. Um, streams and rivers, what's your access point look like? Is the water level high, low? What's, what's happening there? Holding tanks. Holding tanks get a little more, there's, there's, such, there's so many different looks at it. So if you've got an above ground holding tank, inspect the liners. Look for biofilm. Uh, biofilms are population of bacteria and different organisms. If you take and you have a black liner and you take your finger on that black liner and you, you push it and you feel a slime, it's usually a biofilm. Those biofilms are going to stay there. They're, and a, a shock treatment on a biofilm doesn't work. Okay. It's got layers and it protects itself and you throw chlorine in there, it'll move the first layer. If you've got a big biofilm buildup and you're having issues with E. coli, you may have to drain that and scrub that tank out. Same as a below ground. Usually a below ground tank is sealed, it's protected, they should stay pretty clean. But look inside, make sure it's still staying clean. Uh, I know those old concrete tanks that they have below ground, kids start having issues and, still, and start failing. So make sure you look at that, Say, you know, shut down. If, if you're shutting down a, a tank for a winter, can you cover it? The one that's uh, above ground is an open source one. There's another one I see that they have, the same company has, and they have it covered. So they have less issues with the covered one than the one that's open. So make sure you inspect everything. The below ground tank, do you need to do an end of the year added chlorine so the chlorine's sitting there, in there all winter and then pumping out? Um, it depends on the size and volume. So we're looking at Clorox bleach. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years. I know that different states and counties will look at certain levels. A big ground tank, you can get a pool check to see how much chlorine is there. There's a difference between free chlorine and total chlorine. Total chlorine is the amount of chlorine you add to the water. Free chlorine is what's there available to kill. Just because you add a gallon of bleach to a holding tank doesn't mean there's a gallon of bleach killing things because if there's a lot of debris and organic material, that's going to bind that chlorine. So that means that it's not killing bacteria, it's just binding iron, for example. So you should get a test strip and check your total and free chlorine and try to get it up high enough so you're getting an adi adequate kill. What about a well? Uh, I would do it depending on the size, how deep, you know, Shallow well, I'd start with a half gallon, see if you get a good smell. What you want to do when you shock a well is you want to take that water and run it back into the well, like, like the hose. So you're going to add like a half gallon of bleach and circulate that bleach and that water back into the well until you get a good chlorine smell, so you get a good mix. If you're not smelling any chlorine, add a little more. The other things about water, so we talk about irrigation, but you get into the wash water. Uh, so that's that zero rule for E. coli in wash waters for your hand stations, your washing your utensils you're using. Things you got to remember is chemical properties of water can affect your sanitizers and treatment systems. Metals and minerals can bind sanitizers, making them less effective. So if you're doing a sanitizer and you don't know what your well content is, your mineral, your dissolved solids and different things in there, that could mean as you're wasting a lot of money on sanitizer because it's not doing anything for you. So water plays an important role in sanitizing as well as, as just washing. If you got drinking water, some of you need to meet the potable water. So um, 
depending on where you're at. If you're on a well and you have a processing plant, the state's probably looking at you and, and you're called a transient public water system, so you're gonna have to meet potable water standards. You probably got a group B system and the county's gonna make you take tests, which is your presence absence test. So just a quick basis on this. So the FDA monitoring for genetic, generic E. coli. We're not worried about coliforms. We're not worried about fecal coliform. We always get this question. E. coli is the only thing we have to worry about. So if you see a result that's a total coliform or a coliform, ignore it. It doesn't mean anything because we're just worried about E. coli. Then we get on two criteria. Um, negative for E. coli for water use for the washing of hands, food contacts. Water directly applied to growing produce is considered, and this is where you clarif Dr. Rasko clarified, is it's an overhead sprinkler is considered a food, is a produce contact versus a just applied for growing produce. So if you're doing the irrigation system, you gotta meet these needs. If it's above ground, above your, your fruit, it's negative, but then you can apply that, that log kill. Um, again, it's applied to onions. I don't know if how FDA is gonna look at a log kill on a leafy plant such as raspberries and blueberries where you're gonna have shade if they're gonna just apply it straight through or not. You have to be able to do a study to validate each other works. Oh, yeah. If you've got the data to back up, you do it. Okay, so that's something that we can look at. I'll talk to Mr. Beerlink and others and see if we need to do a, a, a study validation for that kill. And that's it. Questions? Any questions for Ken? Okay, thanks, Ken. No problem.